Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be, and welcome to a reading of a about, I think, a quarter of one of my novels. This is the second novel in the Alex Strange series, and I hope you like it. it this one is targeted more towards a, a perhaps a younger audience. I'm, I was shooting for a broader audience with this one. My first book is a bit more unconventional, and the one that comes after this is aimed more towards an adult audience. So the series, it's all in the same world, but the focus shifts a lot. And it's its a lot about, it's a set in the same timeline, but each book explores a different perspective on that timeline. So chapter one, Kara lives. Alex thinks I'm dead and buried, but I've been reclaimed and repurposed. I wasn't supposed to remember my past life, but I did. It must have been the blueberry pancakes I smelled when I came back to life. They triggered memories that were supposed to be forgotten. As a tingling sensation slowly returned to my fingers and my face, I remembered my crazy Aunt Lucinda singing Janis Joplin songs, and I remembered my big sister Alex getting taken to the hospital after her accident with the crane at the Jabberwocky construction site. I remembered going to our favorite tree to climb alone. I climbed up to the very top and saw a branch that was just too perfect to try that trick Alex had showed me. I pretended that I was a circus performer until crack, whoosh, thud. I was dead. The only trouble with all of these memories was that I couldn't remember Alex's name or anyone, anyone's name, really. I could remember images and scents, but nothing that could help me figure out where I came from. When I woke up in the Neverland Reclaiming Center, I was given to a new family and wired up to a new sister. She would be the Alpha, I would be her Beta, and together we would be a symbiote. I was starting to get used to having her in my head all of the time and executing all of her commands. Get my soda, she'd transmit via, via our link. Look up Aardvark. Write my report about Aardvarks. Scratch my back, she'd send. I was almost on autopilot with this command structure when she caught a deadly form of pneumonia and died. It was sort of my fault. A beta is supposed to be completely passive, but my alpha was rather weak-willed, and I could get her to do some of the things I liked. Her parents didn't know that she'd gotten sick because I'd insisted on playing a game with her out in the rain, with no shoes. As everyone focused on the horror of her gurgling cough, no one suspected me at all. Betas are barely conscious, after all. After she died, no one wanted me. I was damaged goods and sent to work in the data mines. That was where I met Dr. Navel. He was strong, he was handsome, and he'd been banished to my hellhole by our boss, Dr. Scarlet. She'd accused him of stealing an idea from her, and because of her marriage to the director, she brought back the Inquisition board and got him sent down to the mines to be stuck with losers like me. I never thought I'd meet anyone like him in my whole life. What's your name? he asked. Kara, I said. It was my name from before the reclaiming, before I'd been erased. Not many people knew it. They only knew me as the number on my beta, ex-beta ID card. He was from the educated upper classes, and I was a nobody who barely remembered what school was like from my pre-beta life. What I knew for certain was that people like him didn't belong in my world, and I didn't belong in his. You should get out more. Meet me at that club I told you about, he said to me from his workstation in the data mine. I can't go in there. I'm a freak to those people, a burnout. You're not a freak. They always see the scars left by the beta wire, I said. I don't. 
Well, it's dark in here. Shh, Dr. Scarlet's coming, he said. We both snapped back into our work trances. Dr. Scarlet patrolled the data mines on a regular basis, and our monitoring software ensured that we meet our targets. But Dr. Naval and I were good at multitasking, and Dr. Scarlet wouldn't approve. Are you going to the ceremony this afternoon? I asked. I hate those things, he said. I know, me too, I said, but I was lying. The ceremony always held a sick fascination for me. It was like watching myself get killed and reborn. It gave me a sense that there is no end to things. The ceremonies always creep me out, he said. They're a relatively recent invention, you know. I thought they'd always been done, I said. I was confused by why I believed this to be true, but I knew that advertainment was very powerful, but I didn't know that it was powerful enough to create a false memory. Dr. Scarlet created the ceremony relatively recently when she brought back the Inquisitions, he said. I knew about the Inquisitions from my pre-beta classroom experience. They had been very popular prior to the great cataclysm that gave birth to our modern cities. I didn't know that, I said, confused and stealing a look at Dr. Navel's pretty face. I hate how they do the ceremony right in front of the laboratory entrance. When I first approached those gates as a student, they didn't have any negative connotations, he said. To me, they were a symbol of hope and opportunity. But today, so many people disappear behind those gates that they just symbolize evil. I know, I said. Chess. They say you shouldn't say his name because it calls his attention. You're still wired. You should be careful, he said. I know, but my wire doesn't really work anymore, so I think I'm safe. In any case, I'm too insignificant to matter. They say he goes after the ones no one notices, he says, uses them, and then gets rid of them. Chess was a demon that could take over anyone's mind anywhere in the network, but Dr. Navel wasn't afraid of him because he didn't have a wire in his head. Dr. Scarlet was coming towards us, and we both returned to our work trances. Dr. Navel, she said, putting her hands on the back of his chair in a possessive manner, I have a job for you, and it will reduce your sentence in the data mines. Yes, ma'am, he said. I need you to report to the lab entrance right after your shift ends, she said. Your name will be on the list. My heart was pounding. I worried that this would be the last time I'd ever see Dr. Navel. I must not have been able to hide my feelings very well, because he said, Don't worry, I won't forget about you but I was still very worried. What about the madness? I asked. No one survives in the lab. Not even people like you. All of those crazy people who come out. The lab stole their minds. I've been in there before, he said. I know how to protect myself. But he looked uncertain. Chapter 2. The Ceremony when the Inquisition brought the hooded heretics out onto the stage for the ceremony, the crowd was told to cheer. A group of cheerleaders performed a routine on the left side of the stage, and music blared as the guillotine was brought out. They don't like me because I'm not them, and they only like themselves. They don't like me because I'm not them, and they only like themselves, was chanted by one and all until the lab director appeared on the screen flanked by his two symbiote assistants. He began the ceremony with a solemn pronouncement. I am nothing, I have nothing, my only wish is to pass on the legacy. After that, one by one, the hooded heretics were brought to the guillotine, their faces were shown, and the crime of Gnostical turpitude was announced as the papers containing their life's work were thrown into the fire. The condemned were mostly old men who remembered things that were supposed to be forgotten. But I was surprised to see a number of young people in the mix today. 
I knew what to expect, but there was still a thrill. One by one, the guillotine blade would drop, and the men in white coats would carefully insert their severed heads into the life support machines. They said that they could remain conscious in this state for weeks, but based on their expressions, it looked quite painful. When the scientists attached the heads to new bodies, the results were employed throughout the city as symbols of progress. They were barely functional, but they served a purpose. During every ceremony, one person from the audience was called up onto the stage to assist, and part of the horror and excitement of attendance was the fear that you might be called upon. I had to attend the ceremony because I needed the financial bonus, but on this particular day I'd gotten a bit too close to the stage, and a nightmare was quickly becoming my reality. Two security workers grabbed my arms and hauled me up onto the stage, where I was required to pick up the heads from the basin and hold them high in the air, before handing them to the scientists in white coats. Blood dripped down my face and arms as I dreaded what would come next. I was stripped naked, given a crown, and made to stand on a pedestal. One by one, the scientists brought me flowers until my arms could carry no more and they all fell to the ground. The crowd laughed. After the ceremony, I was given a thin white robe to wear along with my blood-stained work uniform in a nice gift bag. I was about to head back to my room when something in my head began to buzz. I hadn't felt the wire in my head do anything in years, so I was terrified as I lost control of my body and began to march towards the Wonderland lab entrance gate. No one went anywhere near that gate unless they wanted to be pulled inside and killed. Hello, dear, said a voice in my head. I think you know who I am. Chess, I whispered. Yes, he said. There is something I need you to do in the laboratory. There is someone you need to meet. Dr. Navel saw me as I approached the laboratory gate and grabbed my arm, peering into my glassy eyes. Kara, what's wrong? What are you doing here? he asked. My God, you are in shock. Chess, I whispered. Remember Alex? I can take you to her, said Chess, before fading away. I was vaguely aware that Dr. Navel held me up as my knees buckled. We've got to get you out of here. I'm taking you home immediately, he said. With Dr. Navel holding me, I could resist the pull Chess was exerting on me. Safe in my bed, Dr. Navel gave me a sleeping medicine and told me he'd be back to check on me in the morning. I felt his hand caress my cheek as everything went dark. Chapter 3 Still Alive Smile, Kara! My neighbor was taking a photo of my groggy, blood-stained face. That is going to get lots of hits, she said with satisfaction. I'll cross-post it with the video of your wonderful performance during the ceremony. I wish I'd been there to see it firsthand. To think you're famous, famously pathetic, but famous nonetheless. What are you doing here? I asked. She was in the police force and outranked me, so she usually ignored me. Your boyfriend told us to make sure you got to work today. He's really hot, but he must have a taste for freaks. I got up and looked in the mirror. My hair was congealed with red blood, but the wire in my head was blissfully silent. I hoped that Chess had forgotten about me. He's not my boyfriend, I said. Then what is he, your puppy dog? A puppy dog with a passion for blood-covered damsels in distress? I've got to get to work, I said. That's right, freak. Don't dilly-dally. I don't want to have to evict you. I've heard that the mountains are rather unforgiving. I'd heard that there was a utopia hiding in the mountains and that only true believers could find it. They called it evolutionary enlightenment, but I wasn't brave enough to go out in search of it. Instead, I went out in search of Dr. Navel. I hoped he would be at his workstation in the data mines. 
You're here. Thank goodness. I was afraid that Dr. Scarlet had taken you away forever, I said. I wanted to hug him, but I knew I couldn't. People in the city just didn't behave like that. But I still remembered a time and place where people were different. Before I was reclaimed, my sister and I would hug one another. My mom and dad would hug me. I remembered being happy, and this somehow sustained me, even when everything was terrible. My memories of that time were sparse and vague, but I believed in them. Some people said that you couldn't trust your memories, and that they were all just fantasy systems, shaped by advertainment. But I believed in mine. I remembered. At this moment, I was remembering how Dr. Navel smelled. He'd rescued me, and seeing him made me speechless. He didn't seem to be as affected by me. Kara, of course I'm back. I was so worried about you. And you look so much better. How are you feeling? Has Chess made contact with you again? No, thankfully no. I'm just so happy to see you. After what Dar Dr. Scarlet said, I thought I'd never see you again. Thank you for helping me. He smiled, and my heart did a flip. I've got good news, he said. I've been given a team to manage during my off hours. A team? A bunch of wireheads that Dr. Scarlet wants me to train in machine operation. Machine operation? I thought that was only done in the control room, at the center of the laboratory. Yes, well, it means that I've almost completed my sentence and I will soon be free. Free to do what? Free to do whatever I want. Will you meet me at the club tonight to celebrate? Please, just this once. The Rose Network is putting on a show. It is supposed to be pretty good and I think you'd like it. Thanks. Uh, of course, I'd love to go, I said although I dreaded going there. He felt comfortable in those places, but I felt like a charity case or a servant invited to a party with elites. I'd much rather just get my rations and disappear into a park. I liked being outside. The gardens always calmed me. Chapter 4. He Likes Watching You Suffer The music coming from the club was thumping, and I was dressed up in clothes that I clothes that I'd never ordinarily wear, a short, silvery dress. Despite my best efforts, I still knew I wouldn't fit in. The people in this place had studied their whole lives to learn how to have the right look, and I'd always dressed to be invisible. The dress I'd bought for the occasion was too sexy, and I felt embarrassed for having chosen it. I didn't want to look desperate, I just wanted to look correct for the occasion and women who go to places like this look sexy and wear sparkly makeup, right? Right, I told myself. In front of the door, a group of men was smoking something I recognized, but that I'd never tried. People like me didn't go to parties with people like them. When I tried to enter the club, the doorman stopped me. Members only, he said, inspecting my clothes and checking for scars. People with scars like mine weren't welcome in most places. Damaged goods. I'm meeting someone here, I said. He's expecting me. Members only, he said. I stepped back and inhaled the cloud of smoke surrounding the men, shivering a bit in the cold. My dress was far too skimpy to be outside for long. Hey, you, one of the men said. Me? Yeah, you. Want some? Oh, no, I'm just waiting for somebody. We've got a lot of incel credits. We can show you a better time than whoever you're waiting for. You're a data miner, right? I didn't need to answer. Yeah, data miners can't accept incel credits without a special permit. Do you have one? I shook my head. Right. Hmm. I'm sure we could figure out something to trade. You're cute for a data miner. Why don't you have a permit? Oh, beta scars. Ouch. So, you're not smart enough to consent. I moved away from the group, but I could still hear them. They should change that rule about consent. It's a waste. She doesn't look too dumb to consent. Definitely a waste. 
She definitely wouldn't have syphilis. I see the appeal. There've got to be some loopholes, like if you hire her as a cleaner, she's not totally off limits. Hey, you, girl in the sparkly dress, come back over here. We've got an offer. You will not be able to refuse. Finally, Dr. Navel peeked out of the club entrance. There you are, I've been waiting for you. Come in, he said. Seated at a table for two near the front of the room, he ordered us a couple of pink martinis. The little pink drink burned my throat as I took a sip. You don't like it? No, it's just strong, I said. Thanks for inviting me out. This is really nice. We didn't have a good view of the stage, but I could see the basic shapes of the Rose Network performers as they made their entrances and danced about. Violet! Thump, 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 the music blared. No problem. I'm glad you could come, he said, but he seemed distracted. It didn't see to be, seem to be the stage that was drawing his attention, so I wondered if he'd invited me out to make someone else jealous. Iris! Thump, thump, thump. Do you know many of these people? I asked, feeling like I was being stared at. Daisy! Thump, thump, thump. Yeah, we all met in school. Ah, I said, still wondering why he'd invited me here. Petunia! Thump, thump, thump. While Dr. Navel had been in school, I'd been stuck in the data mining pit, trying to maintain a sense of individuality by secretly writing messages and poems to myself on little scraps of paper I made at home. But I'd never told this to anyone, and I didn't want to tell him this now. He was expecting me to be vivacious and fun, and here I was, withdrawing into myself. I'll be right back. There's someone I need to t say hi to, he said. Sure, I said, feeling awkward, sitting at a table by myself. That was when my neighbor spotted me. Kara, what are you doing here? Are you on a date? She was a drunk and loud. Yes, I said. Oh my God, Kara is on a date and look at how she's dressed. Somebody's getting busy tonight. That was when I felt my neighbor's bright red drink spill down the front of my silvery dress. I quickly got up and headed towards the toilets, but almost bumped into a large man who had styled himself as a gray-green werewolf, with micro hairs installed all over his body. I'd never seen anyone with such extensive modification, and I stumbled backwards into a thin, strongly scented man who had skin that was whiter than any I'd ever seen before. The wire in my head began to buzz, and I felt chess take control of me, walking me towards the exit door like a zombie. He was going to kill me. I knew it. Alex, Kara, it is time, said Chess. Don't sing at the table, don't whistle in bed, or Chess will get you before you're ever dead. Kara! Where are you going? asked my neighbor. I didn't want to ruin your evening with Dr. Navel. I kept walking, but I could hear my neighbor talking to her friends as I glided towards the door. My God, look at her. Her eyes are all glassy. Such a freak. You know she's an ex-beta. She's so dumb she shouldn't even be allowed to come to places like this. I walked, zombie-like, towards the Wonderland Laboratory entrance, knowing that I'd be used for some cruel experiment. Your sister Alex needs your help, Kara, said Chess. You really shouldn't spend so much time with that Dr. Navel. He likes watching you suffer. If Dr. Navel hadn't stopped me and broken my trance, I never would have made it home alive. Listen, Kara, he said. We've got to get that wire in your head fixed, and now that I'm on Dr. Scarlet's good side, I can get you a better job. How does border patrol sound? We'd get to be outside. 
That sounds really nice, I said, taking a deep breath and feeling the buzz in my head die down. I felt like a marionette. If Chess wasn't pulling the strings, then Dr. Nabel was, and I wasn't entirely sure that being their puppet was better than Dr. Scarlet's tyranny. Under her rule, I still controlled my mind when I wasn't in the data mines. But with Dr. Navel, I felt like I was under a spell all of the time. It didn't feel like an evil spell, but I definitely didn't feel in control. Chapter 5 Border Patrol Hi, I'm Boaz, said the young, metal-encased soldier. He held out his hand to me, but was a bit embarrassed by how much tech was attached to it. In my new job, I'd be watching over people like him and acting as a sort of kill switch. I was required to push an alarm button if it appeared that their minds had been hacked. Since the wire in my head had been deactivated, I was serving as an out-of-loop feedback to ensure the integrity integrity of the security team. How did you end up as a soldier? I asked Boaz during one of our long shifts out on the wall surrounding the city. The view of the mountains was really nice. But I just wanted to make an impact on the world, he said. But you have almost no control over your mind or body. The automation systems are actually quite cool, he said. They can make me into a superhuman, and when they take over, if they don't run me off of a cliff, I'll wake up in my bed just like any other person. Do you have a girlfriend? There is a pretty girl at the lab that I like. She looks a lot like you, but you're off limits. The property of Dr. Navel. Property? They said you were his pet. His pet? Boaz tossed me a food bar. I didn't feel like talking anymore. Another wirehead girl got dragged into the lab yesterday, said Boaz. Chess, I replied. You really shouldn't say his name. They say he's targeting symbiotes. He pulls the beta into the lab, leaving the alpha crippled and insane. It's a bit like class warfare in a way. I said. How so? The rich people turn their kids into alpha symbiotes, and they get all of the management jobs, and then Chess destroys them. He steals their souls, said Boaz. I never thought of the betas as being souls, I said. Have you ever met an alpha? Soulless. They outsource their souls to the beta. I've never thought of it that way. I think the alphas have souls, too. They've just atrophied. Same difference. My mother told me that books contained the souls of the people who once lived, I said. So, if you steal a book someone wrote, you steal their soul? I guess. I wonder what happens if you steal the soul of a person who isn't dead yet. Do they end up in the asylum with the crazy ex-alphas? I don't know, and I don't want to find out, said Boaz. I hope you never find out either. Your curiosity is dangerous. Curiosity killed the cat. Where did you hear that? An old book I read when I was little, I said. I didn't know that betas got books. I wasn't always a beta, I said. That's another dangerous topic that we shouldn't talk about. Chapter 6. Blackout Every day when I walked to and from my post on the wall, I could tell that something was happening to people. It was like an infection, but it was nothing like the infection that Dr. Navel had given me after our last date. There was a shift in everyone's eyes, as though they were hypnotized. At first, the daily reports said that the behavior change was caused by a new entertainment program. Then they said that there was a glitch in the snowflake method and the virtual identity system. Then they blamed it on chess. After that, it was blamed on the lab itself. Finally, they called it the Echo and said it was emanating from the machine at the lab's core and that it was perfectly harmless. 
Meanwhile, people like my neighbor were whispering that those who had not succumbed to the Echo's influence had escaped the city and run off to the mountains and found evolutionary enlightenment. Soldiers like Boaz and ex-symbiots like me were seemingly immune to this Echo, probably because we had so much scar tissue in our heads that we'd built up resistance to that sort of signal. But we weren't really sure how it all worked. To prevent the mass exodus of Wonderland citizens from increasing, the city had been locked down and shifts on the border patrol had been increased. In addition, some sort of force field had been created and people with active film and film implants in their heads would literally die if they tried to leave the city. Their brains would just fry and they would collapse in a heap with blood trickling out of their ears. I was tasked with picking, up the, picking some of them up and delivering them to the reclaiming center. Boaz told me that the echo was a sort of feedback loop that locked everyone into the same basic dreamscape. Those who were under its influence said that it had a soothing, rhythmic, repetitive quality, sort of like a pattern recognition video game that constantly played in the background of everyone else's minds. Most people liked having that part of their mind occupied, but I knew I would miss it because I liked using it for other things. Back when I worked in the data mine, I started secretly writing stories, poems, and notes to myself. I felt like I had contained my other lives within those pages, putting my soul in a safe place where it couldn't get stolen or where it couldn't hurt me. If it hadn't been for the scar tissue in my head, I would have wondered if writing had protected me from the echo. Boaz and the other border agents thought they were protected by their software package. They'd been under such a powerful spell for so long that the new spell couldn't affect them. It isn't right, I said. Everyone is turning into a zombie. I can't do anything about it, said Boaz. It's coming from the lab. If only someone could get to the control room, then it could be stopped. It could be turned off. I'm really worried about Dr. Navel. He's been in the lab so long, I... You want to rescue him? Yes. I can't help you, said Boaz. I know, but there is this thing that keeps bugging me. The wire in my head was deactivated, so I bet that I could get through the perimeter and enter the lab undetected. Don't tell me about it, said Boaz. Right. I could never do anything like that. I'd probably just get fried like everybody else. Then again, I knew that I was so insignificant and invisible that my plan might just work. You'd never find your way. The lab is built like a labyrinth, and without a navigator you'd be hopelessly lost, said Boaz. Maybe Chess could navigate me, I said. Chess? Why would he help you? He would just kill you. Right. If I only knew what he wanted, I said. There has to be a reason that he keeps dragging people like me into the lab. Going in would be suicide, said Boaz. I need to find out the truth about my sister, about Alex. Chess kept telling me that he knew where she was. Would you die for the truth? I think I would. Chapter 7. Meeting the Devil Chess, I whispered as I approached the lab entrance in the dead of night. He didn't answer. I knew I was approaching the force field that fried everyone else's minds, but I didn't care. I closed my eyes, held my breath, and kept walking. There was a buzz in my head, but it didn't hurt, so I kept going. I was startled and opened my eyes when a female voice played over a speaker. Welcome to Wonderland Laboratory. Our visiting hours are between 9 and 5, Monday through Friday. If you have an appointment outside of visiting hours, please speak the code word at the entry console. I'd made it through. 
I was still alive. I could hardly believe it. I pressed the button on the entrance console and said, Chess. There was no answer, but the heavy gate opened with an ominous creak. Yellow lighted paths and escalator after escalator led me deeper and deeper into the complex until I was immersed in darkness. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road, I whispered to myself. I hadn't wanted to deal with the symbiotes during the daytime, but I definitely wished that someone would turn the lights on. Kara, said Chess. I couldn't identify the source of the voice, but it was not coming from inside my head. I heard a scurrying noise and the sound of a neon light flipping on. When I turned around, there was a rather fat cat sitting on a shelf behind me. He was backlit by a long thread of pink neon stretching out into the distance. Hello, said the cat. I was speechless and stumbled backwards. I didn't know if the, if the cat was real or virtual. Take your time, it said, although if you would prefer a human form, I can do that too. Shall I summon one of my zombies to serve as my body? No, I whimpered. You come here to find Alex, have you not? Yes, I said. Well, your timing is perfect. She is headed towards the control room as we speak. And Dr. Naval? He's around. Why do you want me here? We all play our little games, and I don't have to explain mine. Follow me, dear. You don't want to get far behind. There are a lot of scary things down here. Dr. Naval is one of them. What? What is wrong with him? What have you done to him? Your hero is a very bad man. I knew he wasn't bad. I remembered the first day we met. We weren't allowed to bring anything into the data mines, let alone food, and I'd snuck an apple into my shirt from the gardens. I loved having that little bite of nature close to me, and when no one was looking, I'd take a nibble and remember what it was like to be outside in the sun rather than glued to a computer screen. When Dr. Navel sat down beside me, my apple rolled out of my shirt, and I was panicked that Dr. Scarlet would see it. He saved the day by catching it. I could never forget his smile when he handed it back to me. You must be thinking of a different Dr. Navel, I said to Chess. The only one I know doesn't hurt people. Nope. It is one and the same, said Chess. He kept leading me deeper and deeper into the darkness. The neon pink line was gone now, and blue sparks and grumbling machines closed in on us. Chess, where are you taking me? There are some errands I need to run before we go to the control room. You should stay here. Now don't wander off. I'll be right back. Chess? I can't see you. I can't see anything. I waited for what felt like hours or days. There was nothing but darkness and silence. Kara? I heard my mother's voice saying my name. Kara? I hadn't heard her voice since I died. They told me she had died. Mom? Dad? Their faces slowly emerged from the black expanse, as though illuminated from within. I was crying. I hadn't seen them for so long. But just as quickly as they appeared, they were gone. Mom! Dad, come back! I sat down on the floor and cried. Chess was nowhere to be found. I was alone, always alone, forever in darkness. 
Hello, dear, said an unfamiliar female voice. Who are you? I'm Ariel, Acme, real-time, intuitive, evolutionary learner. I am in charge of operating the machine. She appeared before me as a beautiful feminine mist, but she was trailed by a lively, pixelated shadow that had a life of its own. I didn't know why, but it scared me as it slithered and shimmered about. What is that? I asked. That is my husband, Eric. Acme Random Interface Control. We are sort of like an AI symbiote. Are you a manifestation of chess? No. We supervise different domains. I run the control room, and he has access to the outside world. Chess doesn't tell me anything. Will you tell me why I'm here? You are going to meet your sister, Alex. She has wanted to see you for a very long time. Then why don't you just take me to her? You two grew up rather disconnected from our systems, and we need to do some tests to learn how to better incorporate you. Incorporate us? Yes, dear. Disconnection is poverty. You want to find Dr. Navel, right? Yes, I gulp swallowed. Well, then come along. Chess had told me to stay put, but I followed her anyway. None of this seemed real. She led me to a door that opened onto a brightly lit, walled garden with a beautiful tree growing in the middle. What is this place? It is part of the laboratory cafeteria. On closer inspection, the tree was animatronic, yet from its branches dangled lovely red apples, and I was so hungry. Take one, Ariel said. The knowledge will protect you. Okay, I think I will stop here, and if you want to read further, you may. I go on for another couple chapters in the blog post, but to read the whole book, which is about, um, I think maybe four times longer than this segment, you can get that from Amazon. And um, it expands the world of Alex Strange. Thank you for listening. Until next time.